Welcome to the Welcome. Invest the Difference podcast. We're going to talk about how to grow and scale your life and business by investing in and doubling down on difference makers. So whether it's mindset growth, tactical business strategies, or identifying your unique edge, let's invest the difference and change the world. Diving into this podcast, so excited to have um, yeah. a local celebrity <laughs> with <laughs> with us here today. Um, yeah, no, we're talking about nah, you. Nah, <laughs> man, you're the celebrity. It's awesome. <laughs> Mr. John Rivers of Four Rivers Barbecue has graciously joined us today to talk through his journey. Um, as long as Carlos doesn't kill himself on the, <laughs> the wiring over <laughs> there. Um, and you've had quite quite a career, certainly a big impact in the Central Florida area. Um, and I know the next phase with Four Roots is going to be an even bigger and hugely important thing that I personally have a lot of excitement around because of what we do with our family farm. But um, welcome to the podcast. Mm, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, we were talking about the naming of Four Rivers uh, as we got started, but I'd love for you to um, take a step back and talk to us about like how did how did the barbecue even come about? Because you were in healthcare for many years. I was, but you know, when I was a, a kid, and I, and I I believe this is with everybody. You know, everyone's got a passion. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're born with, and it's a gift or whatever something that God gives you, and it's something that you love. And and actually, I love. I talked to a lot of little kids, and I ask them, I said, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they'll say, oh, you know, I want to be a doctor, or I want to be an NBA basketball player, or I want to be a football player, whatever it is. You know what's beautiful about that? Nobody's told them what they can't do yet. You know, no one's told them that's smart enough and they're not strong enough or they're not fast enough or not pretty enough. And, you know, the, the, the story that we begin to believe, you know, that determines the life that we live. Mm -hmm. And we're just told so many times the things that we can't do. But that passion that we're born with actually never goes away. So when I was a kid, the day I turned 16, I worked in restaurants and I had to work my way all through high school and paid my way through college by going through restaurants and just just loved the every piece of that. And I also wanted to be a doctor. Hmm. And um, some things happen in life, you know, it takes you down different paths and yeah. we couldn't afford going into medical school or anything like that. And so um, I went into medical sales. Hmm. And uh, I spent 20 years. I was very blessed with that. Had a wonderful career. Started, you know, carrying a bag, you know, knocking on doctors' do doors and moved me out to Texas. And, you know, all the while, still love cooking. Okay. And when I went out to Texas, I always say I met the two loves of my life, my, my beautiful wife, Monica, and brisket. <laughs> the first time. <laughs> in that order, by the way, because I've said it backwards before and I got in trouble. You know, don't you know the one time she came to hear me speak, I said it backwards. Oh, no. <laughs> and it, it happened, it was Thanksgiving dinner, and she introduces me to all of her cousins, who are all males, and you know, lots of testosterone flowing and she introduces me oh this guy's you know loves barbecue he loves cooking which i did yeah. but i grew up in florida mm -hmm. okay in jacksonville in particular and we didn't have beef you know especially in the 70s and early 80s and stuff and if you did have beef it really was bad yeah. <laughs> so you had a, you know bad perception you, you didn't certainly didn't know brisket in particular and uh on the dinner table at thanksgiving there's this big beautiful smoked turkey and right next to us like this black piece of meat and I made the mistake and I said what is that and they just lambasted me oh I thought you know barbecue and this and that because you know Texans they live brisket I had no idea what brisket was till I went to Ole Miss yeah and yeah, yeah. really I had mm -mm. we never yeah. like Sonny's barbecue no. is what I grew up on uh -huh. there was no brisket on the menu no, there no. wasn't there wasn't I went to Bono's growing up and it was the same thing it was yeah. all pork yeah and um of course Beer's flowing, testosterone's going, you know, so I'm, you know, meeting them the first time. I'm like- Two oh. favorite hormones. Yeah. <laughs> Trouble. <laughs> Thank God we grow out of one of them. <laughs> um, and I, I look at them and, uh, oh, I'm going to learn how to smoke brisket, you know, better than any Texan in here. Now, I didn't know a smoker. I had never smoked. I've done pigs before, but I'd never done true smoking before. And honest to God, it took me 18 years from that point you know, going all around the country, which was actually a cool part of my job. You know, I as I as I grew in healthcare, I became had more responsibility, and I got to travel the country. And um, my poor assistant, she couldn't schedule the flight back, 
from wherever I was until I hit like two or three barbecue places. And she <laughs> knew I would do that. I just became infatuated with it. And it was really cool. I'd probably been to, I bet you, 200 barbecue places wow. around the country over all these years. And you, know, you meet all these pit masters and they are so nice. And, you know, and they open up to me. Well, I would learn how to do ribs here and learn how to do brisket there and learn tips and tips. And all the time I'd come back on the weekends and I'd, I'd cook in my garage just trying to hone it. And what's really interesting, we didn't realize it was happening at the time, but if you look at my menu, it's specifically non-regionalized. You know, we say it's Texas barbecue, yeah. but my ribs actually came from North Carolina. My huh. burn-ins came from Alabama. My chicken came from Georgia. My tri-tip came from California. I picked best in class flavors, yeah. and then I came back and emulated that, and that's what ultimately built the menu. Interesting. I remember the day <laughs> those 18 years went. I mean, I I, I, I butchered brisket. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would inject it. I'd put you know, rubs and all this over it. And the day I finally got it down, because brisket's the hardest protein of everything to cook and yeah. smoke. By far, it's the absolute hardest. I was so excited about it. I called them. And they happened to be getting together that next weekend. I said, all right, you guys be there. I'm bringing a brisket. And I-, I The Texan family. Yep. I smoked a brisket. You know, 18 I, years I, later. I, 18 years <laughs> later, I got one of these, you know, big Costco thermo bags. I put it in there, got on the airplane with a hot brisket, you know, put it above my head, just like baggage and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I literally, I took it out of the smoker that morning, oh my got on a plane, flew there, and I sat there and I watched them eat it, you know, and then they said, this is really good. Like, All right. I might. Why is brisket so hard to smoke? It is a, it's a protective muscle. Okay. And you know, it's actually the, the brisket, if you look at the cow um, and the head and the, the breastplate, mm -hmm. okay, there's two briskets that go down both sides of the neck down into the hip, and they're there to protect the organs. And, and actually, brisket is two muscles. It's not one. One goes down the front and one goes around the hip. And if you ever go to the restaurants and they'll ask you, do you want moist or do you want lean? And it's actually the two cuts of meat you know, together. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's super thick and there's not a lot of fat in it, inside of it. Okay. There's a lot of fat on the cap on the outside, but unlike um, pulled pork, mm -hmm. you know, Boston Bud is one of the easiest. If you're going into smoking for the first time, that's where you start because there's so much fat in there. You, you can mess it up. <laughs> you can over smoke it. Yeah. And it's still going to be moist, but the brisket you actually have to cook at 165 internal temperature is when meat finishes, okay? Yeah. But you've got to get all those tissues to break down and to release, you know, that toughness. You have to actually cook it, push it up to 188 to 192. And a lot of places don't do that. And the difference is if you cut into it, you won't be able to bite it. You won't be able to chew it. Versus if you do it tender, you should be able to do it with a fork. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So how do you keep it moist by raising the temperature? Is there like a level of? There is. There is. There's a lot of, there's actually smoking as a science, um, which I was fortunate to have that background in it. But um, you, you cook it at, you know, on an open smoker to a certain degree, and let's just say 160, 165, and it takes about six hours to get to that point. And what will happen, people do this at home all the time, and you know, they always say to watch the internal temperature, which is the key to smoking. And your temperature of your protein will go from you know, you know, 20 degrees or 30 degrees when it starts coming out, uh, up to, and it hits like that 160, and it's called the stall, okay? It goes like that, and all of a sudden it gets stuck at 160 if you're watching it. And that's where most people panic and they begin to put more heat on and more, and that's the opposite thing that you wanna do. That stall, there's a conversion process happening in, in all the amino acids and the proteins. It's actually, they're breaking down and they're creating, they're turning into sugars, okay? And the longer it sits in that stall period, Actually, the more tender it becomes, and you get this wonderful buttery flavor from it. So what we do is when it hits that 165, we actually wrap it in uh, butcher paper, okay? And what that does is it preserves all of the moisture inside, and then we put it back in the smoker and let it go overnight. And by the 6 o'clock the next morning when it comes out, it's right at that 188, 192, all the juices are preserved inside of it, and it hasn't been rushed, and it just it falls apart. It's nice and tender. So how many hours total does it take to do your brisket? About 18. Um, 
Let me ask you a question. How many pounds of brisket do you think that we go through at the on the business annually? If you just annually? had to guess. Yeah. Over a million. 4,000 pounds. We're almost 2 million. Two. Whoa, I was way Almost off. 2 million. Yeah. And um, we age every brisket 30 days and get it that flavor and that really enhances it. And then uh, we just season it really simple. You know, if you're eating a steak, what are you going to put on it? Yeah. You're going to put salt and you're going to pep pepper. Mm -hmm. And that's all we do. Just salt and pepper. It's the smoking process and it's over hickory. And hickory gives it yeah. a real nice flavor to it. That's amazing. Wow. I think it's a really cool parallel too to like just life and business, you know? Yes. I yes. think the, oh, I like it. Uh, for me, I'm Italian, Brazilian Italian. I love to cook as, as well. Not enough to open multiple <laughs> restaurants. Restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, 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 for me, cooking is like, truly where I am able to unplug and enjoy just slows my life down. I don't, I haven't had a kitchen for six months. That's a, that's a different story, but I think it's really cool parallel for paying attention to life. And like you talk about the stall, I mean, just the whole, the whole process. I mean, isn't that life, yeah. right? Yeah. We, everybody in life and business and relationships, at some point we always end up stalling and, and, and that's where we end up panicking. And adding more heat on. Yeah. That's I love that. You know, it was, um, 19th century theologian, uh, Kierkegaard, he said, Every th we, we live our lives moving forward, but we tend to understand our lives looking back. You know, and it's during those stall periods and those challenges, that's when we grow the most. Mm -hmm. You know, and some of those decisions that we make when we're in that period, that's what really defines the direction that we end up going. You know, and it's funny, I, I talk to lots of young entrepreneurs and, you know, what advice and this and that. And, you know, there's, there's a number of things, you know, about being patient uh, or being passionate, mm -hmm. <laughs> especially if you're going to go into business, mm -hmm. you better be darn passionate <laughs> about what you're doing. You yeah. can't be a hobby nope. on the side. And the other thing is, is, you know, to be patient and to, to focus on what you actually have and in, in front of you at the moment, and make the most of that until you grow again. Um, one of my mentors in this process uh, was a gentleman named Dan Cathy up at uh, Chick-fil-A. And uh, I remember one Christmas, um, I was talking to him and we had maybe f three stores open at the time. And, you know, now I got grandiose plans. We're going to have, you know, 25 stores and this and that. And I said, Dan, I said, what, you know, what can I start thinking about now and start planning? And what should I put in place so that when we have 25 stores, I'm prepared for that. And uh, he, he laughed at me. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, he said, John, he says, the most important thing to do right now is you focus on what's in front of you. You know, if you've got three stores, it's, you know, the, the operations and the process and the procedure needs to mature. You know, the, the, the challenges that you'll face when you have 25 stores or 50 stores, they shouldn't even, they're not on your radar today. They can't be because you don't have 2,000, 3,000 employees. You don't have this and that. And if you spend your time so much investing in that and missing the important things that are in front of you today, you know, taking care of that guest, um, evolving the business, you know, the, the business that we opened 14 years ago is not the business that we do today. And it can't be, mm -hmm. there needs to be, what's that old saying, you know, you, you hold on to, uh, what is timeless, but you, um, you move on what's timely mm -hmm. and how important that is. And especially in the restaurant industry, and I, I don't think it's indicative only for the restaurant industry. It's, it's for most of them. You have to continuously change. You, know, you have to con in, in a market and in a customer base that's continuously evolving. Mm -hmm. If you're sitting still, you're going backwards. Oh yeah, and you know, and one of the biggest challenges we face, and one of, one of the biggest mistakes we made, was early in our our success. You know, success breeds complacency. Oh yeah, and that's where you get killed. We were just talking about that on our previous episode. Yeah, it's so easy to take your eye off the ball when you're experiencing success. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Or you get scared. You're not going to mess with it because it's working. The formula is working. And you, you really have to discern between what's timely and what's timeless. You know, there's, there's, there's things about a brand that you never want to compromise. Okay. And those are things that are timeless. But if you're, if you're customer centric and you're, you're market centric, you have to be timely. You have to be willing. And, you know, the hardest part of being timely is being able to let go of things that might mean a lot to you mm -hmm. as the founder. Mm. You know, I love that sandwich, you know, I named it after my daughter, but you know what? 
it, people aren't buying it anymore. Yeah. You know, the phony baloney. <laughs> 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 Had to let the phony baloney go. <laughs> Kills me. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's interesting because even at at your level, you talk about your mentors, mm-hmm. and you've mentioned it multiple times on this episode about people that you mentor. Mm-hmm. I and <clears throat> I think it's such a unique perspective that no matter at what level that you're at, yes. you need to give. Yes. And you need to grow. Exactly. You, you, the moment I think you stop growing, the moment you stop learning, you know, that's the end. Yeah. You know, you've given And giving. Up. You've given up 100%. Giving gives purpose. Yeah. You know, and that, that's, there's a difference between success and, and purpose. You know, you can, you can be very successful, but you can also, you can be empty and shallow. You know, money itself, you know, there's so many things. People think that success is defined by how much money you make or how big your company is or the car and such. I know a lot of people who are very wealthy and very unhappy. You know, I, I, I've really come to believe that happiness, okay, comes when you're using that gift, that passion that you were born with, okay, it becomes your day-to-day focus, call it a job, call it an occupation. But when you're stepping in and doing what you were made to be doing, and then there's a third leg, and you're doing it to help other people, to have, and you're doing it to make an impact, that's when you try, you truly find joy and satisfaction. Because once you get to a certain level of success, you know, making money is... is it's byproduct. A, it's a byproduct. That's right. And it comes. Okay. And su- success breeds, you know, further success. But when you can start making differences, then all of a sudden, you know, the entrepreneurial part and the challenging part comes, all right, how do I make a bigger impact? How do I make a big and, and do it over and over and over? And what's really interesting, the growth, uh, we've, we've seen it. The growth of our business has coincided with the growth of our impact that we're doing. You know, the, we started this thing as a you know barbecue ministry in our garage to help you know a little girl who had cancer, and that grew into helping families and feeding people and education and so and so. We we've kept that ministry in the center of our business all these fourteen years, and 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 to me, it's one of the most important things. And when I have a, a young person, we have a, I think a thousand uh, folks on our team now, and my job is to make sure that they are they don't see this as a job that they're just selling a brisket sandwich, that they see this as an opportunity that every brisket sandwich that we serve will change somebody's life. Mm -hmm. And when they look at it from that perspective, going to work day to day is very, very different. Yeah. Yeah. You see, but that's the perspective that I was really hoping we came across today for a couple of different selfish reasons personally. But um, I think through individuals today, a lot of our audience, young entrepreneurs trying to make it, and the entire world around them is 1,000% focused on immediate gratification and showing off all of your highlight reels. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And I think through most of the individuals that we've had the opportunity to talk to that have had the success level like this, they find success through the boring. Yeah. They find success through the long obedience yeah. In the same direction, the monotony, right? Yeah. Um, so, and then the ministry side of things, like that's also like not something that is celebrated enough. Mm-hmm. The impact is not celebrated enough, right? The the Porsche is celebrated, the the boats are celebrated, but like the doing good doesn't get yeah. that. And well, you know, it common anymore? I yeah, guess. and you know, faith based ourselves. As we have found success in business and in life, I've actually found more of a struggle with that, more of like a shame with that in the mm. church community, mm. where growing up, e- even through church, I've always found that like the if you are wealthy, it's almost looked down upon in in the faith based community. In my opinion, yeah. what's what's been your experience with that? That's that is such a great topic, and we can we can really spend hours diving into that. I did learn something a long time ago. Yeah. Okay. You in success, you're going to come to a crossroad of what is defining you. And is it going to be success or is it going to be significance? Okay. Now, success is defined by lots of things. Okay. It's that Porsche. It's the income. It's how many big the company is, your title, you know, your letters after. Now, if you view those 
as a blessing from God, okay? Don't allow them to define who you are. There's nothing wrong with that because God gives you those for a reason. You know, the more that he gives you, the more that he's going to be able to use you <laughs> to make an impact as long as you're making that impact and doing it, okay? But you can't let it define you. Now, significance, okay? People think, okay, for me to be significant, to make a big impact, I got to build an orphanage or a library. I got to create a scholarship. No, you don't. No, you don't. You can be significant in even one person's life and you change the trajectory, not just their lives, but everybody who's around them. And the thing that I try so hard to teach our team members, you know, you have the opportunity to make a difference in people's lives. Every single person you come across, you know, every customer who walks in the front door, the person who's serving beside you, you know, just us walking around, the, the way that you talk to the person checking you out at Publix, mm -hmm. treating them with respect and treating them with love, you know, it lifts them up. And every single day you have that opportunity multiple times, multiple times. And, and the strength and the light and the joy that it radiates from you, it affects everybody who's around you in a positive way, just as much as in a negative way too. So that's, that to me, you know, don't let the wealth, you shouldn't be shamed of it because it's a gift from God. As long as you're using it to build his kingdom and as long as you don't let it define who you are, you know, use it to make, be significant. I would love to hear your perspective on, on this. So, so many, um, very successful business owners, entrepreneurs seem to have this intensity about them, almost freneticness, like they, you know, they just want to keep going and going and build yeah. more and do more. Um, and I, I describe it as an intensity almost. Mm -hmm. I could be totally wrong, but you have this very calm, faith-centered demeanor about yourself. How have, like, it, is that in there and we just don't see it? And how have you been able to make big, difficult decisions in business and continue to grow and build, um, keeping that the calmness, the peace, the faith alive yeah. in your life uh -huh. and in your business so that – because I have to imagine there has been difficult moments where you've had uh -huh. to let someone go, say no to this, uh -huh. and um, – for I, I struggle with that a lot is yeah. like, I, I don't want to hurt people. I want mm -hmm. everybody um, to be successful and have chance after chance. After, yeah. But at the end of the day, we're running a business and sometimes difficult decisions have to be made. So mm -hmm. I'd be curious to hear your perspective on that. Well, there's, there's two pieces in that, mm -hmm. um, the peace piece, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, letting people go. Mm -hmm. There's an analogy that I use. Um, if you're swimming, Okay, you look at a duck, okay? Well, the duck, well, even on a, a calm palm uh, lake, they seem like they're steady and they're going across. But what's underneath? Yeah, they're, they're paddling. They're fast, fast, fast. You just, they've, they've learned how to manage it so that, you know, the strength that they have that's creating that momentum doesn't necessarily need to be seen by everybody. And I will say this, it's, it's a learned skill. You know, because you're absolutely right. Most successful people that are hard driven, there's a lot of passion there. And when y'all say when me, <laughs> when I was young, it's hard to contain that passion. Okay. And it, it, it come, it exudes out sometimes at the wrong time, you know, especially to employees and to loved ones, you know, and you have to learn it, it, it's management. It's learning how to become a leader. Um, you know, people work for people. They don't work for paychecks. You know, if you don't believe me, then go look at somebody who you don't like. And no matter how much you work, you're getting paid, you're not going to be there long. And the more that people trust you and the more vulnerable you can become to them, the more human you are and the greater the relationship is. Vulnerability is, a, is not something typically you think about in a strong leader, but it's vital. Superpower. That's it's the currency of leadership today. Absolutely. Is 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 vulnerability and being trustworthy. And the more that they can relate, the better. So I I, I can't say I was born that way. And I can't say it, it came easy, but it is a it's a constant practice of learning 
you know, of being mentored, of constantly reading, you know, and, and staying, you know, that calm. You know, what's that other analogy? Um, you know, when you're swimming, you know, if you're, if the ocean above you, if you're 10 feet down or 20 feet down, the ocean could be completely rocky, right? But you bring that underneath, it's smooth. Mm -hmm. And you can still operate, and when you operate at that level, no matter what's happening above you, and what's really important too from a leader's perspective, since you brought it up, if I'm the CEO, I go in the window and my whole team is there. I look and I'm like, oh, it's cloudy today. My executive VPs will hear, oh, it's going to rain today. The VPs are going to hear, oh, here comes a thunderstorm. The managers are going to hear, oh my God, that's a hurricane, you know, a tornado <laughs> coming our way. <laughs> How the leader acts, responds, everybody else follows in multiples. So I've had to learn over the years just how important it is that my calmness, especially in trying times, will so much determine and dictate mm. how we come out of it because it sets the tone for everybody else. And in, in our business in particular, in the restaurant business, you know, it's not easy. You know, quite honestly, you know, I thought healthcare was tough, but <laughs> restaurants, especially since 2020, you know, and it is, it's honed our skills um, as a team to stay calm, you know, during these challenging times. And we're not quite out of it yet. You know, people think we're past it, but you know, we're, we're still feeling the ramifications from it. Yeah. It's just, again, it goes back to like during these challenging periods, panic is the absolute yes. <laughs> worst thing to do, right? Yes. It's funny, the analogy about the ocean and the rough, I love to fish mm. and rough oceans make for the best fishing. Oh, you know, because yeah. a lot less competition out there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you learn along the way how to scale mm -hmm. your restaurant business? Because you didn't start out in the restaurant business and there's got to be a giant learning curve that goes along yeah. with not just having a location and figuring out margins and orders and employees and but not like, every not every restaurant scales like that. Right. Either. And now yeah. you've you know got all of these locations. Yeah. No, my, my challenge is actually the opposite. Okay. <laughs> when when I was in healthcare, I, I ultimately became a, a president of a you know a, a company. But my most enjoyable years I spent in business development and in M and A. I, I built companies. You know, I created concepts. I, you know, my job was here's a white piece of paper. Go out, John, and figure out how to leverage all of our assets to increase our earnings. And it could be through buying companies. It could be creating a whole new concept. It, that's just my mind. You know, and that's because honest to goodness, I'm a horrible operator. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about the, the boring. I'm terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the other part of the equation. Getting somebody in there, knowing what your weaknesses are, and bringing somebody in who can fill that gap. And <laughs> <laughs> from day one, before we open the store, I went out and I said, okay, you know, I had a strategy and, and I wanted to differentiate the barbecue business, the model. And, um, you know, instead of serving pork like everybody else, I wanted to leave with brisket. Um, I wanted uh, communal tables. I wanted people to um, meet each other and, 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 and interface with the construction of the, the platter and the line and stuff and all these things. And, and ironically, these are all the things that people kept telling me why we were going to fail over and you know, because we weren't normal we weren't doing what everybody else did we had to differentiate so from the beginning i recognize i don't know how to run a restaurant now i know how to build pharmacies i know how to launch drugs i know how to build businesses so i went out and i said okay i want to build a barbecue business that is we make everything fresh okay high quality food i want it to be in a clean environment okay well lit okay and i want it to be high customer service high touch you know, what other concepts are like that? And Chick-fil-A was one, um, Houston's, Hillstone was the other, and there were a couple of others. And I prayed about it, and honest to goodness, um, and I'd say I'd go out and went out and recruited him, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. we, our, our paths crossed, and I got the general manager from Hillstone's, and he had been there for 14 years, and he was available. And um, he was fortunate. He actually got to work in the garage for a full year when we were doing the ministry. And that was the important thing to me, not just teaching him how to smoke mm -hmm. and how to make the food, but teaching him the purpose 
and teaching him about God mm -hmm. <laughs> and bringing him, you know, along the way to understand the mission. And sure enough, you know, he learned about God. He got baptized. He got married. He's got children, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and on and on and on. But he runs my operations. You know, I always tell, especially entrepreneurs, and they think they can do everything. And, and, and it's understandable because a lot of times the vision's in the brain, you know, up here. And it's hard to articulate everything at one time. So... If you're a submarine captain, okay, and you imagine you got a periscope that comes down, right? Okay, well, the CO looks in the periscope, okay, and what is their job? They're looking at the horizon. They're looking out in the future, okay? They're determining where we're going to go strategically, you know, for whatever the mission is, right? Now, oh, that's the captain. The CO has got their heads down. They're running the, the submarine. They're pushing all the buttons. They're doing everything. You can't look both places at the yeah. same time. And the importance is if your skill set is being the CEO and looking up strategically, then get somebody who's down here. Because when they try to do it, they're going to mess up because they're going to get bored or vice versa. You see a lot of operators who can't grow because they can't think strategically. And that's okay. There's there's nothing wrong. There's no right or wrong position of the two. It's the importance of recognizing the difference between those and stepping into what God made you and then filling that hole, being humble enough to say, I don't know how to do this. Let me get somebody in here smarter than me. Yeah, because inevitably the parts that your weaknesses are and the parts that you don't like mm -hmm. are probably the same. Yeah. And there's a human out there who is very good at it and always. loves it. Always. <laughs> always. Right? So, uh, you know, I always think through that. Now, just through your story, right, from the healthcare side and then going into the restaurant business, and now you've got the farm, Four Roots. Can we talk a little bit more about Four Roots? Yeah, sure. <laughs> 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 there, was, um, there was a point when I, I really felt on my heart that, you know, God was saying open a restaurant, and I'm a corporate guy, 20 years. And me saying, I don't know how to run restaurants and him telling me, it's okay, I got it, don't worry. There was another point in 2015 where I really felt it on my heart. He wanted me to lead, go into this. He didn't, I didn't know what it was, <laughs> but I knew it had to do around food security. I knew it had to, re, had to do with feeding kids. I had to do with uh, protecting the earth and the land. And I remember, you know, writing in my prayer journal one morning, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a farmer. <laughs> and uh, he reminding me, you weren't a restauranter either. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's really cool is I thought God gave me the restaurant as the impact point. And what I've come to learn, you know, we've, we've used it to make impacts, but it was the stepping stone. Mm -hmm in order to do this bigger thing, which is the farm. And I think that goes back to the story of the talents. You know, he's going to give you so much. And if you do well with it, he's going to give you more. Mm -hmm. And that's the same with management too. You know, you bring somebody on and, <laughs> you know, they don't do a good job. You're not going to give them a promotion. And the farm is so much bigger um, than we ever imagined in 2015. It just started off literally just when I found out that um, our kids here in Orange County, um, the public school system, 20% of them, one in five, live in food insecurity. And I remember asking Barbara Jenkins, who was the superintendent at the time, what does that mean? She says, well, that means when they leave school, they get two and a half meals at school, okay? They go home. There's not always dinner. And then I said, well, what about the weekends? And she said, there's, mm. not a, there's no food. In the I, summer. I just couldn't believe that was happening in our own backyard. And that was the impetus. That was the motivation because uh, I live... We won't go into the whole story now, but there are periods in my life in college where I didn't, I live in food insecurity. And so, you know, God, oddly enough, gave me those trials to create that empathy mm -hmm. that I have that ultimately led into this. Mm -hmm. and so the, the farm is started in 2015 um, with the, you know, we didn't know exactly what it was, but we knew we wanted to make a difference in food security. And uh, I'm I'm so thankful today. Um, what are we? 2023 now. Um, it is 40 acres, uh, two you know, two miles outside of downtown, which we were blessed with. Dr. Phillips gave us 40 acres, um, um, and we've got this in beautiful campus, uh, farm campus that we've designed, and 
Um, it has classrooms. It has eight different growing systems in it. It's got the number one hydroponic growing system from the world, from Israel, that's here. We'll be able to produce 40,000 pounds of produce per week just in the greenhouse, not on the farm, but in the greenhouse, and teach these kids where food comes from. You'd be amazed how many young kids we have. They don't know that a tomato comes from the ground. And it's not just the kids, it's the parents. We're two generations into it. And you start peeling back the onion around food insecurity, and it's not, it's, it's the broken food system, which is the issue. Food insecurity is a result of it. But you take a look at, I don't know what you had for breakfast this morning, but if you had any fruit or produce, on average in the United States, that fruit and produce has traveled 1,782 miles to get to our plate, okay? On top of that, you know, we're, we're importing as a country now, over 50% of the produce that we eat comes from outside of the country. And, and you, you beg the question, well, why is that? Do we not have enough farmers? Truth of the matter is, on average in the United States today, we lose over 250 farms per week, okay? We are closing 250 farms a week. And meanwhile, we're bringing in produce from all over the world that's available right here. In Florida, we import 92% of our lettuce comes from California, <laughs> which is crazy. Yeah. We had this wonderful family, the Dudas, down in South Florida who, who grow lettuce. Guess where that lettuce goes? Outside of the state. It's just so- Doesn't make any it sense. It is so wonky. You want to know the worst stat? I'm sorry to, to keep going. No, I, no, no. I know you have a hard stop, so I want to be respectful of your time. Oh, I'm okay. I'll talk for right, cool. <laughs> Um The worst part, the thing that got me. Yeah. Okay. Keep in mind, I got 20% of our kids living in food insecurity. I've got uh, 250 farmers closing per week. I'm bringing all this produce. You asked the question, well, are we not growing enough produce in the state of Florida to fill these gaps? Okay. Annually, every year. In the state of Florida, the amount of produce that goes to waste on the field is just shy of one billion pounds. One billion. I I remember being at your breakfast and I heard that and I was like, I don't understand why. <laughs> what is happening? It is so broken. Yeah. That's that's the definite that's the probably the greatest one of the greatest representations of the broken food system. And um, not to mention the nutritional aspect yes. of the food that's even available yes. for that, right? Like, oh, yes. because periods of my life similar to, to you with some food insecurities, the food that was available though was expired. Yeah. It was processed. 100%. And, you know, the, so just the nutritional 100%. aspect. And then we wonder why yeah. our healthcare system is overloaded. Oh, yeah. You know, the number one indicator, pre indicator of a food desert coming into an area is. Is when they lose their major grocery store. When you don't have access, when a, a, a Publix or whoever pulls out, they have to go to convenience stores now. You're not going to get fresh food. It's mm -hmm. processed. And once that happens, it is, it's the health of the community begins to deteriorate. And that leads to less, fewer jobs, less education, more incarceration, and health care on top of that. Yeah, it's... It's so interesting um, as we've started selling some produce with some other local farmers. You know, I, like this week was a great example. We delivered some cherry tomatoes to people, but they weren't perfectly red little cherry. They were, mm. it was like an heirloom. They're all different colors. There was some purple, there was some yellowish. And, and they were like, what, are these tomatoes okay to eat? And I yeah. was like, that's the problem. They're yeah. probably very yeah. good to eat. There, I was like, yeah. yeah. Somebody asked me literally, what's wrong with these tomatoes? And yeah. I was like, there's absolutely nothing wrong with their, yeah. their – That's education. Right. Yeah. And I do feel like the thing I'm so happy about with the, the farm that you guys are doing is it's bringing – I feel like there is a ton of opaqueness to farming mm -hmm. um, because it is – I remember you saying like for us to go experience a farm, you have to go out to Lake County. Which is where I live now. Yeah. Uh, to find the land to be able to yeah. do that. Get in the Seminole too, <laughs> where I live. Yeah. But it's not. Yeah, it's not in the city center, and yeah. so most people are not growing up understanding how to grow a tomato, how to eat seasonally, because tomatoes are actually very difficult to grow, yeah. and we don't need to be able to eat a tomato in December necessarily. <laughs> so, I mean, there's all this sort of stuff, but when you think about trying to go find that education or find a farmer to talk to, it's very difficult to do, mm -hmm. and farmers, I think, by nature, are not the be out in front of people 
teaching, educating, business developing for themselves, which I th- I think is a whole other aspect of why some farming is is dying as well. Um, and what you guys are creating is a non-opaque, very transparent education system for your average everyday person to understand how food grows, what what good food is, and where it comes from. You know, change happens after um, access is important. Mm-hmm. But I can give somebody a piece of broccoli. They don't know how to cook it. They're going to throw it away. Yep. It's access plus education mm-hmm. plus inspiration. Mm-hmm. And if we can embody those three, then we'll drive change in the community. If we can give people fresh food, we can help them understand how to cook it and why, and then, then teach them why it's important mm-hmm. for their health, their body, and then maybe even a respect for the land and the ground. And how about the farmers and other people that are around you? It just, it, it, it emanates. Yes. It just begins to grow from impact. It gives impact. Yes, exactly. Significant. Exactly. Yeah. Can I ask you something selfishly? Okay. You mentioned your prayer journal. Yes. How often are you in your prayer journal? And can you talk a little bit more about that process? Sure, sure. Um, I would say probably more, not as much as I'd like to be, probably two times, three times a week. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll go in there. Um, and it's, it's. I love it because it, 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 it helps me. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a to-do list kind of guy. And I... The important part of the prayer journal is actually the prayer. You know, every day I start my day, you know, I have a routine. <clears throat> and I'm a, I'm a horrible sleeper. Um, I, I just don't need a lot of sleep. I should say it that way. <laughs> I'm up at 4.35 every day, no matter, no matter what time I go to bed. And I like that quiet time, you know. And you think about it, if, if you start your day, and your day is going to have trials in it. You know, the Bible tells us that, okay. But if you start your day and you watch the news, and you get depressed, or you read the paper, and you find out about problems, or you play a game, or you do something like that, you know, you're starting it by lighting a match. If you start the day with peace and quiet, and just some reflection, okay, and and the word prayer, um, ironically, in Hebrew, means to talk, to converse. It doesn't have to be formal, you know, but if you start your day just talking to your maker, and just, you know, First words I have every day when I, before you can get out of bed, I say, thank you. <laughs> you know, thank you for, you know, allowing me. Someone, I read something a while ago that impacted me. What if you woke up this morning and the only things you had left in your life were the things you thank God for yesterday? How would that change how you live your life? And it, it nailed me, you mm-hmm. know, between my eyes. Like, oh my gosh, you're right. You know, because we're spoiled. We're spoiled in America. We're spoiled here. And Look at the rest of the world, especially some of the stuff that's going on. We, we shouldn't take anything for granted. And yep. I, I like writing things down. And one of the important parts about that, okay, so many seasons in your life, you're going to go through trials. Yeah. And, you know, and, and God puts us through trials not to hurt us, but to strengthen us. Because the stronger we are, the more he's going to be able to use us. Okay. And when you're in the midst of the trial and you think, oh my gosh, how am I going to get through this? There's no way I, I don't have the strength. It's nice to look back <laughs> how many times you've been in trials and how many times you've gotten through it. And it's a nice reminder, like, wow, I forgot that we were facing, you know, when we opened the restaurant, Monica and I were down to, we almost went bankrupt. Mm-hmm. We were down to 60 days of cash <laughs> in the middle wow. of 2009. And we almost walked away from everything. And he pulled us through it. And it's just nice to be able to go back and see that. Can we say that again? Can we talk about <laughs> if you woke up today yeah. and you yeah. only had the things that you thank God for yesterday? Yeah. What would you, how would it change your day? That's, wow. You know, and I, and I, I was hoping you were going to talk about quiet time because I, I think all too often we live in this world mm-hmm. of just go, 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 go. And um, the times I am just with myself, by myself, bring me the most amount of peace. I don't know if it's because I have three kids under the age of seven or, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, every morning, sim- similar to you, 4.30, 4.45, I'm up yeah. and I'm spending a little bit of time with, by myself before I, I go to the gym. Uh, so that was, I was curious about that. And, yeah. and what's what's been really significant for me to learn about you, John, is, you know, um, from the outside looking in, highly successful, very well known, all these accolades that a lot of people look for. Um, But when you get down to it, 
in learning about you in the 40 minutes that we spent together, it's not about you at all. Mm -mm. And I think that's like something really important for the audience in our in our show to learn. Um, the amount of times John has used the word I has been so low mm -hmm. in today's conversation where most of us spend all of our time talking about I. And I think the significance is what really drives, right? Not the success, but the significance. So thank you for just kind of enlightening us on what someone at this level, the most people from the outside looking in going, oh, I wish I had this. I wish I could be like that. I wish I could be like John. Thank you. So, thank you for having awesome, me. Awesome to hear that. And thank you for being a part of our show. Thank Absolutely. you for sharing. Thank it's you for being delight. open. Thank you. Um, where, what, what would you like people to know about the farm, about Four Roots? Like what, if we, if we were to drive anybody anywhere, what would sure. that be? Sure, sure. The, uh, the farm is on located on John Young Parkway. Yeah. It's in between Princeton and Colonial. Yeah, we'll be opening up the classrooms. There's three phases in it. Uh, the first phase is education. So the classrooms and the growing systems, uh, the hydroponics, the aquaponics, all the fields, they go live in uh, January and February of next year. So we'll actually have students on our campus learning about regenerative farming and sustainability. Um, in about another year from now, we'll have the community phase. So we'll have restaurants and we'll have event centers. Um, we'll have a beautiful outdoor stage. Um, so farmer's market, so about a year, probably in 2025, uh, we'll be able to welcome the community on. Um, but, but today, even today, there's so many opportunities to get involved. From volunteering, we do feeding programs. We have two feeding programs a week. We've, we've handed out over 2.3 million meals now using excess produce in the fields from our farmers to help other people. And that's for all volunteer base, 100% volunteer base. We have a, a compost program where we pick up food waste for, from almost 800 houses on a weekly basis uh, around all around Orange County, reduce the food waste. And then we have a CSA program where we collect produce from over 52 local farmers and we deliver it to people's houses every week. And we do that to over a thousand houses today. We're can, one of those. You can find our chicken. Yeah. Yes, I y'all bought some of our um our chicken. Oh really? Yeah, a couple couple harvests ago. Oh, yeah. I love yeah, it. Yeah, we yeah. get we get four roots products. Yeah. Do you? Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. Appreciate Pleasure. being a part thank of the you. show. Thank Thanks you for, for being having here. Me. It was such a joy. It really was. Everybody, thank you again. We have uh, just another just absolute amazing show. Uh, I would strongly encourage you guys to not listen to this one while driving. Mm -hmm. I think this is an episode where, uh, you know, if you're married, kind of bring your spouse into the pit to the mix and use this as a part of your entertainment for date night. <laughs> um, and just take a minute to listen to what has been shared in today's show because I, I couldn't I'm going to have to go back and listen because I want to take notes on the things, but I wanted to also be engaged. Yeah. So thank you, John. Thank you very I much. I hope you have a great rest of your week. Bless you guys. Thank you.